Welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is Evan Thompson. Evan is a philosopher and professor at the University of British Columbia. He specializes in the philosophy of mind and cognitive science, as well as in cross-cultural philosophy with a particular interest in Chinese and Indian philosophy and the dialogue between Buddhism and the Western philosophical tradition. He's the author of several books, including Mind and Life, Why I'm Not a Buddhist, The Embodied Mind, co-authored with Francisco Varela and Eleanor Roche, and Waking, Dreaming, Being. Today, we discuss the idea that all life is conscious, known as biopsychism, and the issues it raises from a philosophical perspective. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, I'm here with Evan Thompson. Evan, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. So you had a paper that came out, uh, I think it was a month ago today, actually, uh, in the Journal of Consciousness Studies uh, called Could All Life Be Sentient? Uh, exploring this position mm-hmm. biopsychism. So maybe we could begin with a bit of a definition of biopsychism and where you, you got that term from. Yeah, okay. So biopsychism is a term that um, that Heckel used in a paper either uh, at the very end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century. I forget the exact date of the paper. Um, and it he used it to mean the idea that all life is sentient or that all life is minded or all life is conscious there you know there are different ways we could put it but he was he was particularly thinking of mind in terms of feeling <clears throat> vital affect and um and sentience and uh so biopsychism is the term he used to refer to that position and he contrasted it with panpsychism which is the idea that all matter is ensouled or is um conscious or minded again depending on the words we wanted to use <clears throat> and then um with something he called zoopsychism which is the idea that uh sentience or consciousness is restricted to animals and he was particularly you know thinking of human beings uh animals who have you know higher you know intellectual capacities and some ability to um to control their behavior willfully i suppose you know you could say um, and in this paper, he, you know, he went through and considered these various options. Uh, he himself was inclined towards panpsychism, interestingly. Um, he doesn't, you know, really take a, a, a final stand on the matter uh, in the paper, at least to the best of my recollection. It's been a little while since I've looked carefully at the paper. So I was taking the term from him. Now, um, I was using it really just to mean this idea that could there be a sense in which all life is is conscious or as I preferred to um, speak of it, that that all life is is sentient. And so then that requires, you know, specifying exactly what we mean by sentience. And the way that I approached that in the paper was through specifically the idea that comes from the inactive orientation or the inactive approach in cognitive science, which has strong roots in theories of biological organization, the idea of life being self-producing, the notion of autopoiesis coming from Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela. And so the way that I posed the question was, from the inactive point of view, or you might say the extended autopoetic point of view, um, life is fundamentally a, a value-driven and value-constituting process. So is it the case that in being value-constituted or value-driven, there is also sentience of value? Um, sentience of, for example, uh, hedonic tone that would be valued as positive, negative, you know, pleasant, unpleasant. Is that basic to... Um, to life itself, and that and that's the question of the paper. So I'm using sentience in that more restricted sense as I proceed through the paper, um, but the inspiration for it is really this broader sense of of, of sentience that um, that in Heckel's case is is used to specify this position that he calls biopsychism. So the paper is not. Um, I mean, in one way you could read the paper as an exploration of one particular way that you might find yourself on a path that would lead to what Heckel would call biopsychism. Right. Yeah. And I I first heard you mention that you're working on this on Richard Brown's Consciousness Live podcast about a year ago. Um, And in that, you kind of mentioned that it was a, you were kind of exploring the the pros and cons of this position, right? You're not kind of uh, died in the wall, like definitely advocating for it. And in um, your book, Mind and Life, were you advocating for more of a zoopsychist position of nervous systems being being important 
Yeah, so this is something I talk about in this in this paper, um, Could All Life Be Sentient, is the position, you might even say more position is too rigid a word, you might even say more just the perspective that I took in mind and life and how that looks to me now. In mind and life, um, I don't rule it out, um, but I, I say that I'm inclined to think that um, that the nervous system and the particular organization that comes from having a nervous system is is crucial for sentience or is decisive for sentience. And I, get, I give kind of various reasons why I think that in mind and life. Um, they're put forward somewhat, you know, tentatively. Um, and so I revisit those reasons in this paper, and I'm I'm much less persuaded by them than it might appear at any rate from how I put it in, my, in, in mind and life. So you could say in mind and life, I'm inclined more towards a kind of zoopsychic position. Um, whereas in the, this new paper, I'm really more inclined to actually, although again, I don't think I have a definitive case for it, but I'm much more inclined to a biopsychic position. And, and there's a, you know, we can talk about why, but there's, you know, there's a number of different kinds of reasons in play there, but, um, this is something I knew when I was writing Mind and Life, but I just have thought about much more. And that is that, um, you know, animal life with a nervous system is a, is a particular mode of life. Um, but life is way bigger than that. Um, much more, uh, you know, ramified and complicated in, in ways that, you know, we're, we're really just barely beginning to understand if we think of, you know, plants and, and fungi and, you know, this the sort of symbiotic, symbiotic interweaving of these over evolutionary history and the sort of deep enmeshing that they have with each other um, ecologically and ontogenetically. So the idea that we would somehow single out animal life as um, special I mean, it is, it is special. There is definitely, there are special things about the nervous system and about neurons, um, but I'm much less inclined to think at least as an a priori matter that that somehow should be the ultimate reference point for understanding consciousness in the natural world or sentience in the natural world. Right, yeah, it, it makes sense that I guess people come to this from different perspectives and you could say, we only know for a certain that humans are conscious or, you know, I really only know that I'm conscious for certain and it seems to be two of my nervous system. So then let's extrapolate from there and be very, very cautious. And that might account for the, the incredible focus on nervous systems and brains when it comes to consciousness research, or you might kind of go the other way and say, you know, we have no reason to not think these living systems are a sentient conscious feel, feel things in the world. And it seems that, I mean, the overarching, from my perspective, the most dominant uh, force in the study of the relationship between consciousness and the, and the mind is, is the kind of cognitive framework of thinking of the brain like a computer, right? And you mentioned the right. um, an active or embodied cognition framework that you've been, been part of, of building, which is kind of opposed or well, in contrast to that. Maybe it might be worth kind of spelling out that a bit for the audience. Yeah, so, so the idea of an active cognition um, originally arose as a way of challenging the understanding of cognition as representation in the head instantiated in the form of um, brain activity, where the idea is that you have a kind of internal representational uh, recovery of externally defined environmental properties and um, the inactive idea is that the, the unit of cognition is the whole relational structure of the organism and environment, and that what is um, what that's fundamentally about is, is action. So there's an understanding of, of, of cognition as you could say, action and inaction bringing forth or enacting the environment as much as um, responding to some environment that's you know already there that that can be pre-specified so rather than taking the environment as pre-specified take the environment relationally and in part constituted um, by the activity of of the organism so there you're interested in the whole kind of you know sensory motor perception action loop as the relational structure for for understanding cognition rather than um, than an internal 
uh, map or representation of an independent outside world. So, so that idea, um, you know, there are multiple sources for that idea in cognitive science. Um, some of it is through understanding biological systems as autonomous and what the what that that is to say as as self-regulating self-governing self-constructing and and the demands that that places on understanding the organization of cognition where a computer model um where you have an input processing output is doesn't capture the autonomy of the system so that's one um one line of of um of argument that leads into the inactive perspective. Um, that comes out of the work on autopoiesis as a kind of paradigm for understanding autonomy in the case of life. Um, then there's other traditions that don't use the word inactive, but that are very informative for inactive thinking. You know, Gibson's work on, on understanding the, um, the animal environment relational structure as the basic unit of perception. Um, so that's kind of in the backdrop of this particular concern with uh, with biopsychism and consciousness in the in the paper that I that I recently uh, that I recently wrote that 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 you mentioned and what I would say there in, in, in relationship to this point about well do we start you know sort of with ourselves as the model um, with a with a let's say strongly cognitive understanding of consciousness so so we we think of consciousness i mean there's an issue about exactly how to characterize consciousness of course but um in our own case we know that consciousness is closely associated with cognitive capacities like working memory and selective attention and metacognition and there's a debate are those capacities actually constitutive of consciousness or are they um are they closely linked to consciousness and, and part of that concerns whether we're thinking of consciousness as cognitive awareness or whether we're thinking of it as um the feeling of being alive which is how i would characterize sentience in its maybe minimal sense um so do we start there and then try to you know extrapolate out or do we start with the very roots of life and work our way forward and try to figure out okay um is it that life and consciousness in this sense of sentience are coeval or or is there some you know evolutionary developmental stage where that where that ensues and you know i think we should work from both directions i don't think um i i think there's a you know eric schwitzgabel has written about this there's a kind of epistemological methodological circle that comes into play when we when we try to theorize about this so on the one hand in order to understand consciousness we need to have some sense of how widespread it is in the in the natural world but in order to understand how widespread it is we need to have some sense of what it is and we we go back and forth we have to calibrate back and forth between these two things so at the at the you know limits we could have a very human-centered approach that really just says, well, um, our reference points has to be verbal reports of people describing their experience, and that's kind of the gold standard, and then we work out from there. Or we take a much more um, evolutionary biological approach, and we try to work forward from our understanding of what life is, and what consciousness would mean in the context of um, of a living system. So I think you know we're caught in this circle, and we we kind of have to pursue it from these different starting points and see um, you know see if they might connect uh, or how they might uh, inform each other as we go along. Right, and it's probably worth emphasizing that cognition and consciousness, you know are separable to some extent, right? That you, when we talk about cognition, we might be talking about storing memories, making decisions, but that doesn't necessarily entail conscious experience, right? And with the theory of autopoiesis and it's kind of the relationship between cognition and life, when that was put forward, that was not so much about consciousness, right? But more about these cognitive processes that may not entail sentience. Yeah, that's right. So so when Maturana in one of the very early papers that is sort of a pre-autopoiesis paper, but leads into the autopoiesis papers with Varela, you know, he says, um, 
living is a process of cognition. The nervous system doesn't create cognition. It expands the cognitive domain of life. He, he didn't talk about consciousness at all. Uh, he, was thinking of, he was thinking of cognition as really um, almost today what we would call um, active inference. That is that you, um, you act in certain ways to bring about um, changes that conform to your sensory expectations. And that involves, at least from the point of view of the observer outside descriptively, a, a characterization in terms of prediction. So the idea that the organism structurally embodies um, a range of predictions about its niche, about its you know, possible domain of action. That's really how Maturana was thinking about cognition in, in, that early, in that early phase. And he would have been inclined not to talk about consciousness until we have, um, until we really have language and the capacity for recursive self-representation via language. So he very much thinks of co consciousness in a more um, in a way that's that's tied to a sense of self that is inherently linked to the representation also of others. So it's social. That's that's how he would have thought about it. Um, but as the autopoetic you know research developed and you know Varela took it particularly in this inactive direction. Um, I would say that it became more ambiguous exactly how to think about, about life and consciousness because Maturana's way of thinking about it was really to think of consciousness in this cognitive you know, self, you could say self-representational way. Um, and that's kind of where Varela started as well in, in his early work, but then much later, I would say, in, at least in his thinking, emerged this idea that, um, that living is sense-making and sense-making is always in precarious conditions involving value and that there is a way that, um, that it, it might be more fruitful to understand sentience as, as really keyed to the kind of affect motivational structure of, of value in the, in the, in the organism's um, you know, self-perpetuation and, and um, need to, to, you know, to keep itself alive in relationship to what is perturbing it. So it's an ambiguity already in the theory of autopoiesis, actually. Um, and this, again, is something I talk about in the paper. Yeah. Yeah, because you really focus in on, on that point that the claim that to be an autopoietic self-producing system is to engage in sense making, which I guess you could say is kind of engaging with the world in a way in which there's some sense of value that could be, you know, that you move towards things that are going to be conducive to your flourishing, but you move away from things that are going to destroy you. But this is very much an objective, or you could say a kind of physical or value tied up with the physical operation of the system. It, it's not necessarily consciousness of value. It doesn't necessarily feel a certain way to not want to be yeah. eaten by a predator, right? And you're using you to, to zoom in on this particular point as, um, would you say maybe like a, a, a weak link in the argument to kind of making a, a kind of bulletproof philosophical case for biopsychism? Yeah, I think that's right. I, I don't think it's the case that there is um, an entailment, you could say, from the idea of sense making to the idea of sentience. Um, there, there is still a kind of gap and you could say it's a kind of explanatory gap. It's a kind of um, it's a kind of conceptual gap that that the characterization of sense making in the theory of autopoiesis really falls out of the ideas of of autonomy and the need to understand autonomy in not purely formal terms, but in let's say you know a, th a thermodynamic universe. Um, and so that becomes explicit really with Ezekiel de Paolo's notion of precariousness that, that he's taking from Hans Jonas. So, so there you have a kind of out, outside, you, you could say, you know, observer, third person characterization of a, of a, a mode of being, sense making, 
tied to an idea of autonomy and autonomous organization. But it's not that that directly entails sentience. There's where sentience is, is this, you could say, um, concept that as part of its content involves feeling, subjectivity, affect. There's a gap between the two. And that, and that is a, a kind of explanatory gap. So no, I don't think it's that, um, that's why it's not bulletproof in the sense of, if, if bulletproof meant you could, you could show from the terms of the scientific model that you, which is, which is an objective third person explanatory structure that you can get out of that as it were, without any further work, an idea of subjectivity. No, I don't think that's. I don't think that's the case. Um, I would add, however, though, that there's a there's another kind of circularity in play here, which is that the the third person explanatory model is an extrapolation out of the lived experience of the biologist, who's there engaged with the other organism, trying to make sense of it. So. If we were to reify the model and think that the model somehow had a standing outside of experience, and then we were to ask, how am I now going to get experience out of it? Then I would say we've made an epistemological mistake at the very beginning anyway. But it nonetheless does remain the case that the model doesn't doesn't bring you into the necessity of speaking in terms of sentience or affect. You could always try to withhold from that. Um, you could always, you could always try to, you know, refrain from that language. Um, and in a way, I, I mean, now we're getting into this sort of deeper, more philosophical territory. But in a way, I think that, um, I mean, that's always possible. Anyway, I mean, I could do that with you if I, you know, I mean, I couldn't actually do it as a, as a, as a matter of lived human practice, but I could intellectually try to do it. I can always step back and try to say, no, I'm just, you know, in the face of behavior and something that looks like me. And I, I you know, I can, I can try to withhold from that. Um, and, you know, philosophers take this, I think, to an absurd limit when they introduce the idea of zombies, which I don't think is, you know, actually a really coherent idea. Um, so that's, that, I mean, that's always possible, but, it, but it's, it's, it's an indication that as, yes, there, it's not as if there's an entailment from one to the other. Um, I'm not sure we should be looking for an entailment, though. I mean, I mean, I'm not sure that that's the right model of understanding or explanation in this case. I, actually, I'm pretty sure that it's not. Um, so that, that, those are a lot of different kinds of responses on different levels to things that you yeah. said, but, um, no, that's super interesting. Know. Cause I, yeah, in the paper, you, you, um, you flesh this out and say that you're, you're kind of advocating for an approach that's different to kind of scientific naturalism, where you could just lay out an objective picture and derive mind from the operation of the physical world. And you say it's a kind of transcendental arg argument or a kind of participatory yeah. epistemology, um, right. Which I think is really interesting that, and as to, I mean, the idea that there could be some kind of gap that you can't just build up this picture from the from the bottom and get you know derived mind to a lot of people I think produces anxiety. But I, you, you know, you just said then that, that kind of maybe it's not that much of a problem. You know, maybe this is a this is just the right way to approach it to approach it. Yeah, I I think um, you know if if you're a, a physicalist and you think that the task is to, to, to get consciousness properly accommodated within a physicalist framework, um, then from my perspective, you're already working with so many assumptions that are, that are philosophically and I would say scientifically problematic that you're, you're never really going to be able to actually do what you're setting out to do. Um, and I, you know, I think we see this in the, in the consciousness literature right now. I think, you know, we see, we see different strategies. So we see, um, 
say in the case of trying to understand human consciousness, we see some people who say, well, you know, the hard problem will just eventually go away. It'll be dissolved because, you know, the, the closer we can establish mapping relationships between experience and the brain, and the more we can manipulate conscious states or brain states for that matter, by manipulating the other term, you know, either manipulating the brain states by manipulating consciousness or manipulating consciousness by manipulating brain states, you know, the, the hard problem will, will, will just go away. Um, that's one approach. I, I'm, I'm not persuaded by that at all. I think that's like saying, you know, um, the more we walk, the, you know, the closer we're going to get to the horizon. I just think it's a confusion of, of, um, of problems, um, which is not to say that we shouldn't be looking at the way that we can advance our understanding of the brain experience mapping. It's just, I don't think that that in and of itself um, solves the problem. Or you get people who say, let's redefine consciousness in such a way that it's just an objective physical functional process. And the very idea of phenomenal consciousness or phenomenality is an illusion. So that's another approach. I don't think that one works either. Um, or you get panpsychists who come along and say, well, the way to deal with this problem is actually to inject consciousness into the very basis of physical reality, but they leave their, their conception of physical reality otherwise unchanged. They're basically physicalists who like take a syringe and you know shoot consciousness into the intrinsic nature of the physical. And, th and that doesn't really, I think, work either um, because you, you, you still have the physicalist framework with which you started. So if that that's the way that you're approaching it. I think you're eventually going to hit a kind of, you know, dead end. But that's not the way I would look at it. I would look at it as, um, you know, we're, and this is where it becomes transcendental. So that's like all of those are naturalists, you know, in the philosophical sense. I don't mean naturalists. It's very important here to be clear that naturalist could be opposed to supernaturalism. So the idea that there are things that fall outside of, you know, the laws of nature. So I'm not defending anti-naturalism in that sense. Naturalism in the sense in which I'm using the term is contrasted with this other transcendental understanding, which basically says, well, look, that physicalist framework that you set up at the outset is an abstraction and an idealization out of a certain method of investigation you have as a conscious subject. And it comes about through the, the development of a method in an intersubjective context that is, you know, the history of modern science. And then if you turn around and say the method, if you equate the method with the intrinsic nature of reality, you equate the method with being, well, then you've already given up the game because then you're, you know, it's impossible to recover the, 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 the presupposition of the method, which is conscious experience. So that's the transcendental perspective basically says, okay, you can't forget that this is always happening through conscious inquiring subjects in an intersubjective community that build the tools and labs of science. And that all presupposes consciousness. So if you objectify that and then think you're going to get consciousness back out of it, you, you've just misunderstood what, what you're actually what you're actually doing. So that's a kind of philosophical transcendental point. Pragmatically, I think it means that we just need to think about the science of consciousness differently. We need to think about it as um, we're, we're investigating how we can calibrate phenomenology and biology in relationship to each other progressively. And, you know, there are different ways that we might understand how we should do that. But in very general terms, that's the idea, rather than trying to collapse one into the other or reduce one to the other. Right. And I think this, this idea of noticing that, that science always takes place in this kind of intersubjective um, mode through living beings like ourselves. I and mean, you mentioned that this, this phrase in the paper, uh, only life can recognize life, which is really yeah. interesting idea, right? That if if you just had the kind of physical chemical description of the universe, you probably wouldn't, you wouldn't notice this living phenomenon that uh, you have to kind of empathize with it to, to some extent. But this, this conception of, of the role of science also feels related to me to um, the idea of whether you could simulate consciousness. And I think we share intuitions here that the act of you know, computation isn't something that has its own kind of objective existence, but also takes place in this way that kind of necessarily requires beings like ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think you can, you can simulate 
various aspects of cognitive processing, certainly. Um, simulate isn't instantiate it's you know you simulate a simulation is a model so we you know we can we can model things um computationally of course uh but it's a further step to say that the computation instantiates the phenomenon that it's simulating and i think that the the you know the, the the computational modeling is is I mean depending on the kind of modeling, but but I mean that can reveal all sorts of important things about the architecture of, for example, the brain and how different um, let's say network patterns of activity are related to you know different states of consciousness that human beings report in various kinds of circumstances. I mean, I, I think that's that can be very fruitful. But if you think, so I would I would say that integrated information theory is actually guilty of this. That if you think that that you can then define consciousness as what the model is or does. So the integrated information theory version of this is just to say consciousness is integrated information theory, um, a flat out you know identity statement. And that's just completely unwarranted by anything in the theory. Um, I mean, it's one thing to say that we have this interesting measure or concept really of integrated information, you know, roughly the information in a system that's um, not understandable in terms of um, the parts. I mean, that's a very sort of just crew general description. Obviously, there are much more precise ways to specify integrated information, but just, you know, let's let's just use that for now. Um, that, that can be a very useful concept for characterizing um, physical systems, for, for characterizing the brain. It may even be that you can establish some very precise correlations between um, integrated information under, under different measures or metrics and the nature of the complexity of the neural networks that say are, are associated with um, waking perception or dream reports, that, that's all great. Um, but none of that licenses the statement that what consciousness is, is integrated information. Um, that just seems to me to be, I mean, that's what Whitehead would call the fallacy of misplaced concreteness is you've taken an abstract idealized concept that really has to do with you as an observer and your relationship to your beliefs about various outcomes. You know, information, at least this is my, not everybody would agree with this, but this is my view, is that information has to do with our, our expectations about the probabilities of outcomes. So it's, it's fundamentally an epistemic cognitive notion. So if you then take an epistemic cognitive notion, reify it, and say that's what consciousness is, that's, that's precisely what Whitehead meant by the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. You've taken something that's abstract, that um, is, a, is a kind of cognitive device, and then you said that's what concrete reality is. So, um, you know, that, that's the mistake that would happen if we said consciousness just is a kind of computational simulation. Right. And to circle back on, you, you mentioned the kind of philosophical zombie and uh, pointed towards the hard problem. I'd be interested in yeah, hearing you're taking more detail there on why you're not convinced by, by that particular line of questioning or of reasoning. Yeah. Um, I mean, the short answer to that is I actually don't think zombies are conceivable. Um, I don't think they're imaginable. So, I mean, the standard zombie argument is to say, um, so what, what is a zombie? A zombie is a, is a, is a physical duplicate, therefore also a functional duplicate of me or of you. Um, and it's going to do everything exactly the way you or I do it from the outside physical functional point of view, but there's gonna be no consciousness on the inside. So we can say those words. I just, I just said them, right? <laughs> we can say those words. Does that mean we can actually imagine that where imagine or conceive means not just, oh, it doesn't seem to me when I say those words that there's no contradiction, um, which, is an, which is already not very strong because maybe there is a contradiction, I just can't see it. Um, when we ask, 
what about positive conceivability? In other words, how am I now going to spell out that story so that it makes sense? Um, I think it's, I don't, I don't see a compelling way of, of doing that, of actually spelling out the scenario in a way in which it makes, makes sense at all. Um, if you think that consciousness is a life regulation process and that systems that are conscious can do things that systems that aren't conscious can't do, then right there, you're going to be very skeptical about the idea of the, of the conceivability of this, of this scenario. So um, I, I, I just don't think anything follows, uh, follows from, the, from the thought experiment um, at all. Uh, and I, and, you know, so, I mean, the argument usually goes zombies are conceivable, whatever's conceivable is possible. Zombies are possible. If zombies are possible, you know, physicalism is false. Zombies are possible. Therefore, physicalism is false. I mean, that's the usual way the argument goes, but I, I just, I don't, I don't see why I should think zombies are conceivable right. in the first yeah. place. Yeah. I share your intuition there. You know, I think there's a sense of conceivability where if you said to me, can I imagine a plane flying back backwards? In a sense, I can picture it and it's moving in a certain direction. Sure. But then if I right. was trained, you know, if I was an engineer who worked on planes or even with my rudimentary knowledge, um, right. I can't actually conceive it. If I think of what would happen, have to happen with the air and stuff, it just doesn't. So right. it, to me, it seems more of a comment on our lack of understanding or you know, collective consensus on what the mechanism is that produces consciousness. So it's more pointing to that than a natural problem. Yeah. I mean, there's that. And then there's also our lack of understanding of, of what the physical or nature is. I mean, so the, the zombie scenario gets set up by saying um, a physical for physical duplicate, but we don't know what physical means. Um, you know, physical is, is like an empty word. It, it, I mean, so this is, this is Hempel's dilemma, right? Is that physicalism means either what physics today tells us is the physical. So if we try to imagine the zombie scenario in under that heading of the physical, well, already we can't account for consciousness, of course, because the physical as we understand it today um, doesn't give us any obvious way of accounting for consciousness. So that's why we, you know, we're trying to figure out the relationship between consciousness and nature. So if we define, you know, phys the physical in terms of physicalism today, then physicalism is false because the physical as we understand it today is inadequate. If we define physical in terms of what physics at the end of the day, if it even makes sense to think of the physics that way, says is the physical, we have no idea really what we're talking about. So I, I just think physicalism, physicalism devolves to naturalism. It devolves to the commitment that we can understand nature and mind in nature without the framework of something that stands outside nature, like God, um, that can act to alter the laws of nature or to violate them. So, of course, yes, I'm committed to naturalism in that sense, um, but that doesn't entail physicalism as, as metaphysics. And, and I don't even think we understand what, what it means to say that, you know, this metaphysically speaking is, is physicalist. It seems empty yeah. to me. Yeah, I, I agree that it's empty to say well, the totality of existence is X. Whatever that concept is, is kind of meaningless and empty because, I mean, all language is kind of relational. And so if something in absolute terms, if it's this absolute right. substance, I don't really know what that means. But I, I think there's a sense, there's a sense in which people use materialism or physicalism where what they really care about is is emergence and if you think that this mm -hmm. unfolding thing that's studied by physics that makes up my body uh, those things we call kind of particles and chemicals come before mind before consciousness in that sense I think, you know, sometimes that's the thing people really care about when they say physicalism and I, i'm assuming that's something you're kind of aligned with yeah so so one way to do one way to respond to the argument I just gave about physicalism, the sort of Hempel's dilemma, is to say, well, look, um, whatever physicalism means, it has to rule out panpsychism, or it has to rule out emergence, strong emergence. Um, you can make that move, um, but then you're doing um, a priori physicalism. You're sitting in the armchair and you're saying, um, whatever the physical is, it can't accommodate emergence and it can't accommodate panpsychism. 
Um, but that doesn't seem very compelling to me either, because, I mean, Galen Strawson, for example, argues that if you understand physicalism properly, you will see that it entails panpsychism. I mean, that's a novelty, and this relates to emergence, because the novelty of his argument for panpsychism is basically to say, um, let's assume that everything is one, and we're going to use the word physical to designate that oneness of stuff. Um, let's assume that consciousness is real, so it's a concrete, real phenomenon. Um, let's let's deny emergence in the sense of strong emergence where the idea would be that on the one hand emergence involves a kind of dependence relation on the physical because we're talking about something coming from something else when we use the word emergence. So the emergent phenomenon has to in some sense depend on the physical and in some sense wholly depend on the physical, um, but it also has to be novel and not derivable from or predictable from or um, generatable from the physical understood at the level of the fundamental physical. So then, you know, Galen says, you know, well, we don't have any model for that kind of emergence in science. Um, it would just be a kind of brute postulate of emergence. So we have no reason to accept it. So we deny that. So then it's, it's a very ingenious argument, I think. You know, he, he basically says, okay, given those constraints, um, panpsychism follows that, that um, you know, experience is going to be um, concretely and fundamentally physical, at least in the case of certain systems like the brain. And if it's the case for certain systems, it's just much more parsimonious to assume it's the case for the physical writ large. So we get panpsychism. So um, that, I mean, I think that's a, that's a very interesting argument, but, but what it signals to me in terms of physicalism is, is again, physicalism is just wildly unconstrained as a metaphysical thesis, because if you, if you go with that argument, then it turns out that we, what we thought were opposed positions, physicalism and panpsychism turn out to actually, it turns out to be the case that the, that physicalism on his argument entails panpsychism. So, um, so that, so, so that's, you know, sig signifies the, 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 the emptiness, I suppose, of, of physicalism as a, as a kind of metaphysical position, at least, at least to me. Now, with the concept of emergence, which is actually what you were really asking about, um, um, I think that there, there are different ways of trying to say what emergence would be. Um, and I think that the tendency is either to say that the tendency is to divide them into so-called weak and strong forms, where the weak is supposed to be in some sense compatible with reductionism and the strong is supposed to be um, uh, a violation of, of reductionism. And that's not really how I think about, I mean, it, yes, you can think about emergence that way, but that's not really how I think about it. I think about um, emergence as having to do with how processes at different spatiotemporal scales, you could say, individuate themselves into novel patterns. And I think that within science, it's not the case that we have a worked out reductionistic understanding of that phenomenon such that we can say it's compatible with reductionism. That is, if we actually look at um, the literature on, um, I don't know, something like superconductivity or the relationship between, you know, mac macro physical, uh, macroscopic physical processes and underlying microstates. Um, or the formation of the, the, the special molecules and their in, interlocking relationships in a biological system. Um, I just don't think we have worked out reductionistic understandings of those. So I think pragmatically speaking, what we do is we work at both levels. We, you know, we describe things at one level, then we describe things at another level, almost as if it was sui generis. And then we build models where we try to relate them, but the models are never, I think, um, they don't ever live up to at least the classical ideal of micro reduction. So then emergence just becomes, you know, something that's pragmatically there in, in how we are modeling uh, 
phenomena and explaining them in relationship to each other. But that's a that's a kind of pragmatic view of it, not a not a sort of a priori metaphysical view of it. Yeah, this the aggressive kind of um, alignment with reductionism and unease around emergence. I've I've always been slightly baffled by. I'm not sure why some people are so bothered by it, but. Um, yeah, I'm interested then what your um, kind of metaphysical picture of the world would be then. Yeah, can you say more? Can you say more? <laughs> I mean, because it's not, I don't think of myself as like having, here's my metaphysical picture of the world. I mean, I, in that sense, I don't as a philosopher do metaphysics. Right. Um, I'm sympathetic. Um, I'm, I'm actually similar. I, I find it not particularly it doesn't feel like a useful project for at least the way my mind works. I don't tend to become that. So, okay, that's, that's good. To, I just it was intrigued to see if there was some, a nice, easy answer you would say as opposed to physicalism. I mean, I, I could say one thing. Um, I mean, I, 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 I think that the, you know, here, here's a sort of general way of, of talking, you know, if the project is to understand mind and its place in nature, I don't think we can do that with, the the physicalistic picture of nature as it's you know usually put forward i think we 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 need a, a kind of deeper revolution we we need a revolution that deepens and transforms our concept of nature um i don't think we are, we're going to do that just by sitting in the armchair and doing and doing metaphysics as an a priori project though you know some of the metaphysical reflection in the armchair is fine to help us clarify and see the relationships between different concepts and 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 things like that but i think that you know it it, it comes about through science and through this would be the transcendental part reflecting on the the, the necessary conditions of possibility for a scientific understanding of the world which in my view always relate back to consciousness and intersubjectivity so within that way of proceeding, I think understanding mind in nature requires a transformation in our concept of nature. So um, that's meta. I mean, if I put it that way, that's metaphysical. But it's not as if I'm going to say, you know, right. you know, it's panpsychism or it's you right, know, it's right. this or it's that. And and so your um, the issue, as you see it, with physicalism is its inability to capture consciousness and its al its allegiance with naturalism, understood as a commitment to only only things that can be understood through the kind of objective scientific method, exist. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I would say I would say physicalism. The way I would put it is that physicalism confuses a method with a metaphysics. So the, the method is we start with our concrete lived experience, say in the case of, let's, let's use an actual example, the, you know, the, the bodily sensations of hot and cold. We start with that and then we progressively abstract and control and manipulate phenomena in special you know, places that we build laboratories or what Robert Kreese calls the scientific workshop. And we embark on a kind of spiraling project using math and logic of creating, you know, ever more refined abstractions with ever more um, precise experimental manipulations. And so we come up with notions like, you know, heat and, and temperature and, um, you know, mean molecular kinetic energy and you know all of thermodynamics um but all of that is intelligible ultimately because of our lived experience as embodied bodily subjects who feel things like hot and cold and what physicalist does is it takes the product of the method that started with experience gives us these abstract idealized structural invariants and then it says that's what reality is. So it it inverts what I think is the case, which is, you know, reality is concrete and spatiotemporal, and the abstractions are certainly related to it. They're not, you know, they're not just like fictions floating nowhere. Um, they have a foothold in reality, but to turn around and define reality as fundamentally what the abstractions are is I think a mistake. Uh, 
that's what it's what Husserl called the surreptitious substitution. You substitute the products of a method for reality. It's it's what Whitehead called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. So th that's where I think you know, naturalism is the commitment to a certain explanatory project. Physicalism is the transposition of that into a metaphysics that defines the physical, which is supposed to be, you know, concrete reality in terms of the products of a method of abstraction. Right. And, so, and so that's what I would disagree with. Right. So it's a kind of fundamental mistaking the map for the territory instead yes, of realizing that's that... Right. Reality is exactly. this unfolding thing, and right. it, when we say it's made of atoms, that it's not actually made of atoms. Atoms are a model that we use to describe right. its behavior, right. really. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, That's right. And so, to to circle back on the kind of the main thrust of the paper, with um, you also explore zoopsychism, you know, whether nervous systems would be necessary for consciousness. Um, but you also conclude that that's that's also not kind of bulletproof. You know, that has its own, own problems, right? Right. Yeah, I think that I think the best um, case for zoopsychism is this, you know, this wonderful book, um, the the sensitive soul um, by uh, Ginsburg and Yablanka, where I mean, it's, 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 it, I really have great admiration for this book, you know, they, they basically say, well, you know, the way we should approach consciousness is is similar to how we approach life in terms of the origins of life. So we, we look for um, what they call transition markers. Um, so in the case of you know life, it's that there's, you look for systems that have a certain kind of self-renewing organization that leads to stable reproductive lineages. And once you have that, that's kind of a, a transition marker for the presence of life. And so they say, well, what would a similar transition marker for consciousness be? And their proposal is what they call unlimited associative learning which is the ability to learn associatively, but to form novel associations and to key novel behaviors to these novel associations. And they say, you know, when we have unlimited associative learning, um, we have a whole suite of, of cognitive processes that come into play. And we know that you need a certain kind of biological organization or architecture to be a system capable of unlimited associative learning. So you certainly need a nervous system um, and you need a nervous system of a certain kind of complexity. You need a certain, um, you need a certain uh, organism, you need a certain ecology, organism, environment relation. So they say, okay, so it's not that we can infer that there, that, that, without a unlimited associative learning, there couldn't be consciousness. It's rather that we're gonna say where there is unlimited associative learning, we have very good reason to believe that there is consciousness when we understand it in, in these cognitive ways as involving you know, binding of cognitive operations, you know, sort of global broadcasting of information in a sort of workspace functionally defined, um, some sense of, of, of bodily selfhood, um, so we, we take these properties of consciousness that researchers have singled out and we say, um, those are gonna be present when you have unlimited associative learning. And then we, you know, we relate that to, to the nervous system. So, I mean, I think that's a, that's a really interesting and, and in a way beautiful line of argument. Um, the problem with it, so that's like, in my mind, that's like right now today, the most sustained developed case for zoopsychism, I would say, is in their work, um, because it's very principled and it's you know it's very worked out empirically and theoretically. Um, the problem with it is that it's not so. There's one is a conceptual problem. It's not clear that these cognitive processes that they identify are constitutive of consciousness in the most fundamental sense of say sentience, the, the, the feeling of aliveness. Um, we know they're closely associated with that in certain kinds of conscious cognitive beings, especially ourselves, but whether it, it would be contentious to, def to define consciousness in terms of them. Some people would be sympathetic, some people wouldn't be sympathetic and that's 
an outstanding debate in the science of consciousness right now. So they're sort of, they're taking a stand on that. And then given that stand, they're basically inhabiting this methodological epistemological circle that I referred to earlier that, that really um, Eric Schwitzgebel has written about by basically saying, okay, given that conception of consciousness, now we can formulate a conception of how widespread consciousness is likely to be in nature. That's fine. Um, but if we started with a different conception of consciousness, namely the idea of sentience that I explore in the paper, then we would have maybe a different idea about how widespread consciousness might be or, or could be in nature. And so in the paper, I, I, don't, I don't argue against zoopsychism. I basically say, here's its limits, the ones that I've just gone through. And then I say, here's you know, the biopsychist perspective and here's its limits. And that's kind of where we are, I think, in the, in the current state of, of play in, in consciousness, looked at, especially from the point of view of biology. Right. So when laid out in a kind of rigorous philosophical way, that's the conclusion you come to. But as an individual with your own intuitions, where, how mm -hmm. widespread do you think consciousness is at this point? Oh, I, I mean, if, if we're not talking in terms of argument, that's, you know, conceptual, uh, philosophical, if we're talking about um yeah intuitions or gut feelings or inclinations or something like that right. um so th this is also something i report in the paper i i had an experience once of watching a, a film of the complicated behavior of um a protist with endosymbiont bacteria and it was it was a film that the biologist lynn margulis who's was very well known is is she's passed away but very well known for her work on symbiosis and cell evolution so she showed me this film where you see you know this sort of large kind of um cor quorum sensing bacterial behavior all kind of um in in sort of shifting patterns of um of synchronous activity um you know at attached to um, this larger organism of the protist and the and the complex um, behaviors that they are enabling for each other. And I'm, you know, I'm not trained as a biologist, you know, I, I've studied a reasonable amount of biology and sort of, you know, apprenticed with Francisco Varela. So it's not like I'm biologically unschooled, but I'm not a biologist. And so she just walked through everything that was happening in this, you know, complicated um, ecology of organisms and described it in a way that just made it immediately compelling to me that this is an instance of sentience. So now this is not an argument. You could say, well, she was, you know, she was using a certain kind of language um, that was guiding me to perceive things in a certain kind of way. And we know that when human beings perceive um, patterns and movement, they're strongly inclined to you know project agency onto them i mean i i know all of this i know all of this is true but at the same time when you're in the presence of of something that's that's not just like your immediate intuitive gut feeling but something where you're actually being given a lot of information about what's biologically going on by somebody who really has spent their life studying this kind of thing um you know, the, my, my immediate feeling was, well, you know, of course, this is an instance of sentience, not, not probably an instance of, you know, reflexive self-consciousness, um, but an instance of, you could say, a feeling of aliveness, of vital affect, of being in a, in a, in a world, or even if we don't want to use the word world, being in a, a milieu where things have different kinds of saliences and attractions and repulsions, you know, that was immediately compelling to me and it kind of changed how I, how I look at life. Um, and, you know, I, in, in the paper, uh, so I report this experience and, and the reason I report it is because, you know, Peter Godfrey Smith in, in his book, Metazoa, which is, which is a, another marvelous book, you know, he, he basically throughout this book, he kind of skirts this question, you know, is all life sentient or is it really about animals and nervous systems? And at the end of the day, he decides it's about animals and nervous systems. And he 
and he has this, you know, I think it's a, it's a very revealing and, and marvelous statement at the end of the book. He says, you know, when I look at bacteria, I just, just doesn't feel to me like they're conscious. Um, but my reaction was exactly the opposite when I saw bacteria and protists with this, you know, rich description that Lynn Margulis was giving them. It was like, yeah, I mean, it changed my perception of life as life is this, 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 um, you know, a, a, a kind of amazing thing that's happened on our planet or happened to our planet with this, with this, you know, complex and highly interdependent ramified elaboration of, of sentience, where it seems weird when you look at that way to all of a sudden think that this peculiar mammalian primate form that's so caught up in its own head and its own that's our special way of being is that we're sort of reflexively, you know, um, uh, enmeshed with ourselves in this internal way that is, you know, a kind of internalization of our relationship to others, that we would think that, like, that's what consciousness fundamentally is. To think that is, is to sort of be at the very tip of the mountain and, and think that the view you have doesn't depend on, like, the whole ecology of the mountain and the valleys. And, and so that's kind of more how I feel about it now. Um, so yeah, right. that's not an argument, but that's a, that's a statement of yeah, conviction or, yeah, um, right. you know, yeah. I think it's highly relevant as well because of the privacy of, of consciousness. We have to rely on our intuitions to some extent, right? To, to guide us and obviously intuitions can be flawed. Um, but it's interesting to me that there's, there can be such a spectrum because I agree a lot of the time there's this appeal to people just saying, well, it looks to me like they're not conscious. So I'm going to assume uh, that's the case. And especially when it comes to plants, right? Like with recent yeah. kind of plants intelligence, suddenly if you, uh, I mean, the BBC recently had a, a David Asper documentary called Green Planet, where you have all of this amazing footage of sped up plant behavior. Yeah. And it, you know, it makes it very vivid to you that like, well, that's not as relevant to me as a wolf biting me or something. So the wolf biting me, I can really kind of get into this mindset of trying to kind of uh, imagine myself as it and its intentions and its inner states, because that's relevant to my survival. The vine that's slowly kind of climbing, that's not really relevant to me. So I, I don't need to engage in that kind of thinking. So exploring kind of intuition, I think is really important. And around the time your paper came out a month ago, there was a, a publication maybe from the Johns Hopkins psychedelic research group, but showing that when people have these ego dissolving psychedelic experiences, it tends to increase their attribution of consciousness to different systems. So right. they're more likely right. to say that uh, plants are conscious, things like that, which I think is right. very interesting. And so maybe we could move into a phase where we more systematically explore intuitions and what it is that leads people to different intuitions around consciousness as well. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we have certain kinds of intuitions because we have, uh, a certain culture and a certain right. history that structures our intuitions um, that's now heavily informed by the development of modern science, right. um, which, I mean, what I think is interesting is that in the case of this experience I had with Lynn Margulis, I mean, that is a product of modern science. I mean, the ability to, to, um, to see these beings, which we never could see before, um, you know, to, to image their behavior, to understand their their structure, not that we have a full understanding, but to understand aspects of their structure, their evolution, their development, we never had this kind of knowledge before. So I think that when you take that kind of scientific enlargement of perception and enlargement of understanding as material for intuition, you start to get different kinds of intuitions that you know, that may actually be in some respects, not in all, but in some respects closer to intuitions that we, you know, that we may have had prior to the emergence of science. Uh, I mean, you know, when we, when we lived um, where most of us were much more involved with the plant world, uh, you know, than our, than our intuitions are different. I mean, even people who work with, you know, plants today, either as scientists 
or I mean, my son's an arborist, you know, so he just, he, he like laughs and scoffs at the idea that trees aren't sentient. He just thinks, you know, you, you just haven't spent much time around trees if you think that. And, you know, it's easy to be scientifically dismissive in our culture about something like that. It's like, oh yeah, well, we attribute agency. And so, yeah, of course you spend a lot of time around trees. You're going to talk about them from sort of like, you know, a dented intentional stance and, you know, um, but I think that, um, you know, intuitions have to do with how we act and relate to the world and the kind of knowledge that we have. So, you know, with this increase in our scientific knowledge of biology, and then, and this is being forced upon us with the climate crisis, the need to actually recover some, you know, stronger relationship to the biosphere, I, I think our perceptions will, will very likely shift. Yeah, I think you're totally right. That It's deeply, deeply informed by culture. And when we situate the origins of science, at a time when an economic system that was around exploiting nature was developing and Descartes you know, comes to prominence when it's very convenient to see the world as blind mechanism, you don't have to feel any kind of empathy for it. Um, I think there's a, right. along with Christianity as well, there's this huge kind of tradition that's got momentum of kind of human exceptionalism and not having to pay attention to nature. And while it's not, it's not a, um, an infallible thing to, to feel empathy or identify with the tree and think that it might be sentient, it's definitely not, we get the impression that, as you say, like people are more likely to just say, oh, you're just engaged in some kind of fantasy rather than thinking, well, maybe it's the person who withdraws subjectivity from those organisms that's engaged in fantasy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's right. And, and you know, the zombie scenario is the ultimate right, attempt exactly. to withdraw subjectivity. It's this idea that you can, you know, um, you, you can, even if only intellectually, you can imagine you're supposed to be able to imagine what it would be like for me right. to regard you right now as a zombie, which is, I, I mean, I think it's preposterous. I think it's just, um, it's taking to the limit a certain Cartesian conception of, right. of the world. Yeah, I think if we hadn't been introduced to this Cartesian way of seeing where we're told that certain things are blind mechanical robots, and then we say, well, if that's, if that's a blind mechanical robot, why aren't you? And it's, it's a slightly right. strange <laughs> way of looking at things. Yeah. Um, well, thanks so much for your time. I've really enjoyed this. Um, is there anywhere thanks. you would send people to online uh, to enjoy your work more? Uh, so if people are on Twitter, they can they can follow me on Twitter. Um, my uh, web page is evanthompson.me. It hasn't been updated in a little while, so the sentience paper isn't there. But um, the paper that we talked about, Could All Life Be Sentient? It's in Journal of Consciousness Studies, but there's an open access version at the Philosophy of Science Archive. So people can can get it there if they don't have university subscriptions to Journal okay. of Consciousness Studies. Yeah. Great, and I'll put a link in the description. And thank you again. Great, thanks very much. Thanks for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you want to help the podcast reach a wider audience, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you want to offer financial support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook.